we're looking at 1 Timothy, uh, second part of, of chapter 1 we're looking at this morning. And what we're going to see this morning is the, uh, the amazing benefits of God's grace. Now, I was going to do a special Thanksgiving uh, message uh, today uh, with the Sunday before Thanksgiving, but then I, I, I got in our scripture this morning and uh, looked at where our next section was, and Paul starts out in our next section in 1 Timothy chapter 1 by saying, you know, um, right there in verse 12, he says, oh, go back to where I'm at here, 1 Timothy, verse 12, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And so he starts our section saying, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he goes into the benefits of, of all the things he experienced in God's grace. So I thought, pretty appropriate. Let's stick with First Timothy this morning and look at, again, the benefits of God's grace and being thankful for God's grace in our lives. You know, God's amazing grace. And if it ain't amazing, here it is. It ain't grace. Right? Grace is amazing. I love that first song we sang about amazing grace. It's just, it's amazing. It blows, us, blows me away every time I think about the depth of God's grace for us that have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is grace? Grace in the Greek is karas. It's undeserved merit and favor from God that we experience once we come to Christ. Because, again, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you're saved, through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Paul also wrote about grace in Titus chapter 3 when he says this, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Here it is, verse 7. So that being justified by his, what? His grace. We were made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, one of Paul's favorite topics as he wrote a third of the New Testament was grace. You know, there's a, 124 references throughout the New Testament to grace. And Paul had 86 of those references. Grace, grace, grace. 86 times he talked about it as he wrote a third of the New Testament. Paul loved to talk about, teach about, write about, and live with God's grace. Why? Because God's grace saved him. God's grace changed him. God's grace sustained him. God's grace gave him what he needed to go throughout the whole Roman Empire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, grace is one of our distinctives of Calvary Chapel. It goes all the way back to Pastor Chuck. And uh, as he began the church, he taught through the book of Romans. And he had a grace awakening himself. And he wrote a book, actually, called Why Grace Changes Everything. And it does, doesn't it? Grace changes everything. Grace. We're going to talk about that this morning. Pastor Chuck, founder of Calvary Chapel, also had a saying. He said, if I'm going to err... I'm going to err on the side of grace. And I believe that too. So with that background in mind, let's look at our scripture. If you're there, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, say amen. amen. Okay, here it goes. Here it is. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. So first of all, Paul's recollecting his uh, Damascus Road experience. Remember the story, going back to the book of Acts. Paul was breathing murderous threats on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. And all of a sudden, a, a light brighter than the sun shone around him. And those words from heaven came, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And the, the voice from heaven said, I'm Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. And now you're to go, he was told in, in the book of Acts. He, he said, I'm Jesus in prison. Let, get up and enter into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And here's what was told to Paul. You're going to be a chosen instrument to bear my name, the name of Jesus, to kings, to magistrates, to, you know, Gentiles, to Jews around the, around the Roman Empire. And he did. Three missionary journeys. He went 
and brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he went from being a Christian killer to the, probably the greatest missionary the, the, the church has ever seen. Amazing. Amazing. But he had some struggles along the way. Wasn't easy. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 gives us a list of some of the things he went through in these missionary journeys. It says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I'm more so in far more labors and far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. Can you imagine that? Just floating around in the Mediterranean somewhere. On, on, <laughs> I've been on frequent journeys in D- dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness. Are you getting the point? Dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without cold or without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without me being weak? Who is led into sin? without my intense concern. And Paul went through that for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's the first point I want you to see in verse 12. Is the first point is this. Jesus Christ, by his grace, strengthens us in our service for him. And Paul needed that strength, didn't he, in all those shipwrecks and beatings and imprisonments and everything else. And he found it there. And he said this in 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 18. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me. And the Lord did what? Strengthened me. So that through me, the proclamation might be fully accomplished, that all of the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. And the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. And the church says, amen. Amen. And what Paul's saying there, again, is God through his grace and Jesus Christ and his presence strengthened him for the service that God called him to do. And that's what God can do for us too. No matter what you're called to do, I mean, being a godly parent, being a witness at work, serving in the church, you you need to know that God by his grace can give you what you need and strengthen you to do what God's called you to do by his grace. It's a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. I'm, re- I'm reading books right now by Charles Spurgeon. I, wrote a co- I read a couple books on Charles Spurgeon, uh, what he had to say about the Holy Spirit. Two different books on the Holy Spirit. And now I'm reading a book on revival. And uh, Charles Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers. Probably one of the greatest preachers that has ever lived. Amazing. But Charles Spurgeon... Um, had some health issues and had gout, severe cases of gout. Sometimes they had to carry him up to the pulpit just for him to be able to preach. But you know what he would do is he'd go up to the pulpit on a regular basis. He'd say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then he'd get up and he'd preach. And he'd preach sermons that were just amazing in regards to the chalk filled with Scripture and also anointed by the Holy Spirit. See, that's God's grace that gave him what he needed by the Holy Spirit to do the things God called him to do. And God can do that for us also by his grace. And we should be thankful for that. Amen? Amen. He gives us what we need to do those things he's called us. His, His callings will be empowered with enablement as we trust his grace as we go through those things we're called to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul talking about this says this. He says, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, what does Paul say? Then I'm strong. One of the verses we have around here that's a key verse for our ministry here is of, um, of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. Through him, through Christ, who gives us strength. Amen? And that's one of the things we're graced with, is God's strength as we trust in him, as we go through the things God's called us to do. Now go on, verse 13. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, how was Paul a blasphemer before Christ? Well, blasphemy is speaking evil about God. Blasphemy is cursing God. 
And that's what he did about Jesus, and Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word Jesus was God. And the Word, Jesus, became flesh, and he dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. And he was speaking evil against God by speaking evil against Jesus. And he says, even though I was also a persecutor, a persecutor of what? A a persecutor of of the church, and thus a persecutor of Christ. He said, why are you persecuting me? In persecuting the church, he was persecuting also Christ. He was a violent aggressor. The word for aggressor there is someone who is hunting people down. That's what he's doing on the road to Damascus as he's going there with breathing murderous threats. He was hunting some more Christians down to persecute them. But, he says in verse 13, I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And here's what he's saying about that. He's saying, I didn't know better. I thought Christians were, were, were a hazard to my Judaism. They were, I was stomping out Christians because of the, 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 he thought they were a sect that was, was, was going to uh, hurt Judaism and the law. But it says in verse 13, in the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Now the word there, abundant, means overflowing like a waterfall. That's how God's grace was in Paul's life as he encountered Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus. And also, look at where faith and love are found. Where's faith and love found? In Christ Jesus. In a personal relationship, he found faith and love in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 15, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Another version says, I'm the chief of all. He was the chief of all sinners. Because again, he was a persecutor, he was a violent aggressor, he was one that was trying to stamp out Christianity. Now interesting, when it says it's a trustworthy statement, um, uh, that's five times in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus, Paul says it is a trustworthy statement. Many scholars believe what he's making here is a statement saying this, this is a, a, a creedal statement from the church. And then he'll say it is a trustworthy statement, and then he'll make this statement of truth. And what's the statement of truth that he's making here? That Christ came into the world to what? Save sinners. What's the name Jesus mean? Jehovah is salvation. What did Jesus say his mission was? I came to seek and to save that which is lost, sinners. Uh, He was called a friend of sinners. When uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus beginning his public ministry, he pointed his disciples to Jesus and he, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what he was all about, was taking away our sins. And that's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amazing, isn't it? God demonstrates, Romans 5, 8, his own love for us. That while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And that's what Paul's reflecting on here is that Jesus Christ, his mission was to come and to seek and to save. That was lost, to save sinners. And then verse 16, it says, and yet for this reason I found mercy. In order that in me, as the foremost, as the chief of all sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Here's what Paul's saying here. One of the reasons why God chose me and saved me is that I might be an example that God could save anybody. I was a Christian killer. He's saying he was a persecutor of the church. He was a a violent aggressor. And Paul says now... I'm saved so that people could see the perfect patience of God with me. And they could see that if Apostle Paul gets saved from being a persecutor of the church, anybody could get saved. Amen? And here's what Paul's doing here. He's giving his personal testimony. He's talking about where he was before Christ, that's the testimony, how he met Christ, and then the difference that Christ made in his life. And you know what? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, We overcome the accused of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony and not even loving our life unto death. 
Our testimony has power in it. And that's the next point I want to give you about uh, God's grace. God's grace, and we could share this in our testimony, can radically change our lives. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Behold, new things have come. And I tell you what, a part of our witnessing about God's grace to a world that desperately needs to hear it is we need to be sharing our testimony of how God saved us. We need to be sharing before Christ where we were at. We need to be sharing how we met Christ. We need to be sharing the difference Christ has made in our lives. Because there's power in that. If you've been coming to this church for any period of time, you, you know that even, even from this pulpit on a regular basis, I'll share how I came to Christ. And I'm going to continue to do that. Because there's power in that. There's power in our testimony. It's a part of our witnessing to be sharing how God has radically changed our lives by his grace. You know, we have the privilege here at Calvary Chapel Lexington <laughs> of seeing this on a regular basis. We see people get saved here all the time. It's a privilege seeing the radical change in people's lives here at Calvary Chapel Lexington. You know, for the last several years, we do baptism every summer, uh, Memorial Day weekend and then Labor Day weekend. And we're, we see every summer, it's about 100 people for the last several years get baptized. And many of those people be, have have come to Christ here at Calvary Chapel, and the God's radically changed their lives. We see that in our YouTube for Christ program on a regular basis, too. We see guys coming off the streets, coming off of drugs, and doing all kinds of stuff out there in the world, and then they come here and they come to Christ. Amen. And then God radically changes their lives. And we've seen, a, 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 we've seen people going to the ministry out of U-Turn for Christ. I mean, half my staff is graduates of U-Turn for Christ. And it's awesome. Because God radically changes lives. Amen? Amen? And that's another thing that we see with God's grace. It got, it's God's grace has the power to radically change our lives. Listen to Ephesians 2, verse 1. It says, uh, describing the process of salvation. It says, And you were dead in your tra- trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. This is B.C., according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of the disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Amen, church? God radically, by his grace, changes our lives, and we should be thankful for that every day of the week, not just on Thanksgiving. (laughs) Every day of the week, we should be thankful for the way that God's gotten a hold of us, if you're a Christian, and has radically changed your life. Now, Paul, in reflecting upon this, reflecting upon how God, by his grace, reached down and saved him and radically changed him, is moved to worship. And he's about to explode in worship. Look at the next verse, verse 17. Now, to the king. Who's the king? Jesus. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. To the king eternal. Jesus is eternal. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He was and is and is to come. And to the king immortal, who will always be. To the king invisible. He's invisible right now physically to us because he's in heaven. But there is coming a day we're going to see him face to face and then we too will be like him. But right now we have to have that faith which is an assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not yet seen until we see him face to face. And he's also the king who is the only God. Jesus is God. He said, I and the Father are one. And again, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things were created by him and through him and for him. And he holds all things together. He's God. And that's a part of our worship of Jesus. You're worshiping him as God. And then he says, be honor and glory forever and ever. And again, the church says, amen. Amen. Here's here's the next thing that God's grace does in our lives. As we see God's grace and we experience God's grace, here's what happens. It moves us to be people of worship. It moves us to be people that are passionately worshipers of Jesus Christ. God's grace does that for us. 
You know, that's one reason why I love communion. When we have communion together, if you've been here for any period of time, on the first Sunday of the month we do communion, after we partake of communion, we have the elements, and we remember, we do this in remembrance of him, what's the next thing we do after we do communion? We worship. And you've probably heard me a bunch of times say, hey, one of the best responses to what we've just uh, celebrated there with the cross is to worship now Jesus Christ and to give him the glory for what he's done for us on the cross. That's a, that's a, a response to God's grace. should be passionate worship. I love our men's conference we do every October that we host for the Deep South and all the churches in the Deep South. We have 600 plus men come here on the weekend. And we have, we start on Friday and we, for, for a day and a half, it's a great time. And I, you know, it, I love the teaching that we have every year at the men's conference. I love the, uh, the fellowship we have with all the guys from all around the South. I love the food. That barbecue is something on Saturday. Travis does a great job with that. It's awesome. But you know what I love most about our men's conference? It's the worship. It's the worship. When you get 600 plus men who have encountered God's grace, passionately worshiping, it's like the roof comes off in here. It's awesome. It's the worship. And that's a response to God's grace. Amen? And that should be a response. Every time we reflect on, on the, how God has saved us by his grace, it should move us to be men and women of worship. All right, let's go on now. Verse 18, it says this. Now, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you might fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regards to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered over to Satan, so that they might be taught not to blaspheme. Now, here's what's going on here, a little background on this. Uh, Timothy had words of prophecy spoken over him, is what he's talking about right here. Probably at the beginning of his ministry. There's probably people that were surrounding him with prayer, and the Lord gave those people words uh, for, specifically for Timothy. Probably words of encouragement, probably prophecies for exhortation, for encouragement, for comfort. And then probably they spoke into Timothy's life, uh, the blessing that was going to be on his ministry, the gifts and calling that God had for him. And now Paul's saying, Timothy, reflect back on that. Remember those words that the Lord had spoken for you. And, and keep, keep in the faith, fight the good fight, and keep a good conscience is what Paul's saying to Timothy. And also, he's talking about two other guys, too, that didn't keep the faith. And what happened to them? They got shipwrecked, and Paul had to hand them over to Satan. What does that mean? He had to excommunicate these guys out of the church because they probably were going into false teaching and everything else. And Paul said, out of here. Similar to what he had to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with that person that was uh, being immoral in the church and sleeping with his father's wife. He handed him over to Satan too. And that's church discipline. So here's the last point I want to give you on God's grace. Is God's grace helps us to fight the good fight, keep a good conscience, and not get shipwrecked in our faith. And you know what? I've been a... Christian now for over 45 years. I got saved in 1978. And I've been a pastor for, you know, 38 years. And I've seen a lot of Christians get shipwrecked. I've seen pastors get shipwrecked. What helps us not to get shipwrecked? What helps us to keep fighting the good fight? What helps us to keep a good conscience and not get veered off course? It's God's grace. God's grace. And it's remembering scripture like 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as you start getting off course in your Christianity, the first thing you should do is run to the throne of grace, confess your sin, receive God's forgiveness, repent, and get back on track. And then trust in scriptures like 1 John 1, 7 that says, the blood of Jesus now has cleansed me from all, all my sin. Trust in scriptures like Romans 8, 1 that says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Trust in scriptures like 
Proverbs that talks about a righteous man will fall seven times, but what's he going to do? He's going to rise again. You know what? Um, one of the things that's helped me in the last 45 plus years of walking with the Lord not get shipwrecked is I was discipled well in grace. The uh, guy that discipled me initially, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Dave, uh, he was a Bible college professor. You've heard me talk about him before. And he had a nickname at the Bible college. His nickname was Dr. Grace because he was so centered on teaching about God's grace. And he taught me well on grace. And so times where I feel like I'm, I'm veering and I'm, 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 I'm getting off course and stuff, I go back to what I've been taught on God's grace. And I remember to run to the throne of grace, confess, repent, and get back on track. Same with uh, Pastor Chuck, founder of Calvary Chapel. He's a man of grace, again. I've listened to most of the Bible being taught by Pastor Chuck. I used to have that wall full of cassettes. I had the, I don't, I don't know if some of you remember cassettes, right? And I had... You remember how you had, could put, put like, um, uh, have like a, a thing you could uh, have the cassettes in? I used to have a wall full of Pastor Chuck's cassettes. And I listened to most of the Bible taught by Pastor Chuck. And as, he's, as he teaches, God's grace is just threaded throughout his teaching. And it's helped me to stay on course in my Christianity. And it'll help you too. Remember God's grace. When you start getting wayward, run to the throne of grace. Confess, repent. Get back on track so you, could, so you could keep fighting the good fight, you could keep having a good conscience, and you not get shipwrecked in your faith. Amen, church? So let's look at, again, the four things, the four things that help us with God's grace, the four benefits of God's grace. Number one, Jesus Christ, by his grace, strengthens, strengthens us in our what? Service to him or for him. Number two, God's grace can radically change our lives. And that's our testimony. Our testimony is before Christ, how we came to Christ, and the difference Christ has made in our lives. Number three, God's grace moves us to be what? Worshippers. I'd, I'd like to say passionate worshipers of Jesus Christ. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And the last point on God's grace is God's grace helps us to fight the good fight, keep a good conscience, and not be shipwrecked in our faith.